Hello, this is David Rovix with another episode of Discussions with David, a live stream broadcast I've been doing every Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday during the pandemic, as long as I can't travel and play music for a living anymore. I'm also broadcasting on Mondays and Tuesdays. Mondays, I host Pandemic Open Mic Mondays, which anyone with a song, poem, or rant is encouraged to sign up for at davidrovix.com slash P-O-M-M. Tuesdays, I host Fifth Estate Live, produced by Peter Werby. All of these live stream broadcasts start at 10 a.m. Pacific, noon Central, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. GMT every weekday, and you can find them both live and in archived form on the Facebook pages of Popular Resistance, KBU Community Radio, and my own Facebook pages and channels on YouTube, Periscope, Twitch, VK, and LinkedIn. If you go to davidrovix.com or search on any podcasting platform for the podcast This Week with David Rovix, you can also find these programs in audio form soon after they're broadcast live. Another place you can find the broadcasts, along with lots of free content, as well as content reserved only for patrons, such as my 16-part audio memoir, is at patreon.com slash davidrovix. That's also where you can support my various musical and non-musical efforts at Popular Education. Today, I have the honor of welcoming back Mike Africa Jr. to talk about what's been happening since the last time we spent the hour together way back in early May, approximately forever ago. To refresh your collective memory, that was already months into the pandemic, which was already clearly exposing the many massive inequities in U.S. society, but still three weeks before the beginning of the uprising that has been taking place across this and many other countries. Since that time, I've been watching Mike Africa Jr. in Philadelphia from here on the other side of the country in frequent YouTube videos of him giving amazing speeches into bullhorns at many different gatherings of people. Mike is a brilliant hip-hop artist who I was supposed to be touring with in Europe last spring if the borders hadn't all closed. He is also a loving father, urban gardener, and community organizer. He was born in prison where his parents spent his first 40 years. As a child, 500 heavily armed police attacked his family home, very intentionally massacring men, women, and children. Mike, welcome back to my live stream show. That's, Thank um, you for having me, David. Thank you for I always have. I mean, it's I, I can't I can't I can't really not introduce you with a ma without a massacre in the introduction, and I guess that's that it, it always tends to set the tone, I suppose. But uh, but it's a very appropriate tone at the moment, as it always is. Uh, and I, I wonder if you could just like I know it's a, a massive question, but can you just give us some kind of a picture uh, from your vantage point of what's been going on over the past two months, but especially in Philadelphia, but everywhere? Yeah. Well. Over here, people are really tired. A lot of people have, you know, rose up like a tidal wave and just, you know, just taking the power, taking the power back and just letting the powers that be, the powers that was, understand that this is our country, this is our land, this is our people, this is our freedom that we're fighting for. And, um, and we're not giving up and we're not taking this thing lying down. So people have been protesting. It's going on uh, six weeks, constant protests every day, multiple protests every day. And um, I've been a part of organizing some. I've been a part of participating in some that's been organized by others. And um, I will continue to be a part of this. And this is going on in every corner of the city, would you say? Every, every Today, Mike Pence is coming to town. Oh, gosh, yes. And he's going to be at uh, Lodge, uh, FOP Lodge 5. Ooh. And there will be a contingent of uh, protesters letting him know exactly how we feel about his presence in this town. It won't be a small contingent, I imagine. This is going to be quite something. This is this afternoon? This, or this afternoon. evening? Mm -hmm. this, this afternoon. Uh, I, I, yeah, actually, yeah, it is early evening. I think it's, I think it's sometime around like 6 o'clock. And he's he's coming to is it downtown Philadelphia? No, it's northeast. So so the city, there's parts of the city that are very diverse, but there are other parts that are very segregated. So like West Philly is probably the most diverse part of the city. The parts of North Philly are beginning to be gentrified, but it used to be the poor black section. South Philly was like the Italian Irish section. Northeast is reserved for like the cop lover. Um, Daniel Faulkner support type people, a whole lot of racist cops like Fishtown. Like you can't cross, black people don't go to those parts of the city. 
Um, and that's where the police lodge five is. And that's where the FOP building is. And that's where Mike Pence is going today. Black people don't, I've never, I've been in the city all my life and I've never been there. Wow. So it just, it just wouldn't be a safe place to walk down the street. Or ride wouldn't. a bike. Ride, ride a bike. Mm -hmm. No, you don't. No, we just don't go. It's, it's kind of like in, 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 West, in uh, West Philly, where I actually grew up at in West Philadelphia, in, in, the, in a section of the city that uh, the locals refer to as the bottom. White people didn't come down there. If they did, if they were caught down there, they never went back. Hmm. You know, it's, like I said, it's very segregated in a lot of ways, although the city has built up their diversity portfolio kind of well kind of good in the last 20 years mm. you've been getting quite a bit of media um in just in the past couple of weeks uh with with the uh the uh th this collective uh, black black radical philly collective and this wonderful statement and i wanted to explore the 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 13 points in there but i'm wondering if have you been getting death threats since that's been in the news um, if I have, I don't, I haven't heard of, I haven't heard it's of it's nothing, nothing that's come to you on, on, uh, Instagram or YouTube or something like that. It's not, uh, it's not been like that at this point. Now, usually when they come to me with death threats, it's more like a promise. So like, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, right. It's, it's more like a, <laughs> I can't unclear. be by a threat. So if I, I've made, I maybe I have, may have even heard some death threats but if there's just some words i didn't even i didn't even give it the validity they were trying to accomplish i don't know i don't, right. I don't even care right like <laughs> it's hard to know how to interpret th those things but then the um one of the things but it's hard to take a death threat serious for me right you know what i'm saying like really like you really want to kill me i mean i've been i've faced I faced the, the the death. I've looked death in the eye multiple times, right? Like somebody want to threaten Mike Africa Jr. with death, right? You, with, better with, be, with, you better be willing. You better be willing to accept what you're trying to give me. Mm, mm -hmm, right. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I believe in self defense and I ain't violent. But <laughs> while this death is supposed to be coming to my doorstep, I wonder what they think they're going to be getting from me. Right. When when you're when you're very when you're spending every day in front of a line of riot cops with loaded uh, weapons, then uh, the, the death threats uh, seem maybe less. There's a lot of uh, static going on. I don't know if there's something touching your microphone or I don't know what that is, but it's this weird on, let me popping. See if I can, let me see if I can figure out what this is. Mm -hmm. It's gone now. Better? Yeah, that yeah, sounds great for for the moment. Yeah. Oh, there it comes again. I don't know. I don't know. Technology. You know, I've but... had a couple of problems with StreamYard. Oh, is it? Do you think um, it's this platform? I, hmm. I think. Well, I didn't think it was before, but I did an interview with StreamYard um, about a week ago, and I had the same sort of issue. But it only happened when the host talked. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, I can hear everything anyway, so it'll all be just fine. It's just this little staticky noises, but it's not it's not blocking out uh, you know, everything that can you're you saying. Hear, can you hear the staticky noises when I talk or when you Yeah. Talk? Oh. Yeah, both. I think it now now I'm not sure because it's happening when I talked. <laughs> Let's see. I have I don't know. I'm wearing headphones. Well, we can process that out of out of it, out of it later <laughs> in the, well, in the uh, audio see. processing. So now I'm talking right now. I can't hear the popping sounds. Can you hear them now? When you talk, they're happening, but just really quietly. So anyway, the main thing is, and and so the main it's mainly happening when I'm talking. You're right. It's it's louder when I'm talking. So yeah, it's what's important is that people hear you anyway. So it's okay, and they can hear me fine. I'm sure it's just a little static. But it's I love the background though. Greenery and trees and looks yeah, like I'm you're in West there. Philly. Yeah. That's a that's I'm a, right behind I'm right in front of my mulberry tree. Oh great. Did I you plant a, it? How long how old is that tree? No, no, it, it was here when I got here. Mm -hmm. My mulberry tree. 
And then I don't know if you can see my garden over there. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and my, you do it. You had any time for and your little pup? Yeah. You had any time for gardening over the past uh, few weeks? Uh, well, we're at harvest point now. I mean, all of my greens are are growing and they're ready to just be picked as as we need. Um, I think we may have like our spinach is pretty much done. We our kale is is thriving. Our except for the groundhog that eats is, eats more than we do. Um, the collars are good. The chard is good. We had some peas that the groundhog ate. And then we have some tomatoes that we're waiting on. Ah, great. Yeah. What's the, have you gotten any impression about what the situation is with, uh, I mean, I, you know, it's kind of obvious walking around the city of Portland that everybody is getting more desperate by the week in terms of the financial situation, in terms of people moving out of their apartments and into cars and into tents and people going hungry. Are, are you getting much of an impression about that aspect of life in Philadelphia these days? Um, no. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a this is a really big city. Yeah, it's a really big city, and you know, you may not like you don't you don't really know how big it is until you go to other cities and they say the gas station by so and so street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you say that in Philly, you that that just you're going to have a long conversation trying to figure out where exactly that is. Um, you know. There's 10 gas stations on, on Market Street, right? Um, so I haven't, I, to answer the question, I haven't seen a lot of that. But people have, here in the city, because it's such a large city, there's a lot of resources. Um, and by resources, I mean a lot of friends that, you know, will let you crash. A lot of, um, a lot of empty houses. You yeah, know, that's a thing there. A lot of empty houses, huh? That's not so much a thing here until recently. Oh, in the city of Philadelphia, you can go eight blocks in any in any in any residential neighborhood in the city of Philadelphia. You can within eight block radius, there will be at least forty abandoned houses. Hmm. It's Philly that's, has actually lost a lot of population over the decades, right? Is that right? Yeah, I mean, like so, a lot of cities have. Like in like 1990, I think we had like 2 million people here. Mm. And now we're down to like 1.5. Um, maybe, maybe, no, maybe in like 1980, we had 2 million. And then after the bombing, a lot of people left. Um, after 9-11, a lot of people left. So we're, mm. we're down to like 1.5 now. Why 9-11? Was that a, a particular moment where a lot of people left for some reason? I mean, I, I understand in 1985, when, when the move home was bombed, and that makes sense, a lot of people would want to leave. But 9-11 wasn't quite such a local affair. Um, no, I think it was. <clears throat> I think after 9-11, people felt like this is the city that did this bombing thing, too. And so they didn't really want to be a part of it. And then um, a lot of a lot happened too when um, when the uh, when the jobs started to dry up. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm. um, you know, things are things are the gentrifiers are they started moving in about 10, 15 years ago, and that became a huge issue. Um, and it, and it still is a big issue even with all the vacant housing. The gentrification still drives up the cost of housing, does it? Is that is that yeah, a big problem? What happens is what happens is they give they they raise the taxes by this like three three times. I think uh, my my friend's mother's tax was taxes here in the city were like nine hundred dollars a year, and they were raised up to twenty seven hundred dollars the following year, and hey. then the year after that they went up again. Wow! So for the so that's that's three times more than they were. And being that that's three times more than they were for that nine hundred dollars, imagine the people that were paying twenty five hundred dollars, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, people just try to find another place. Um, if your taxes are what you what some people pay for in rent, 
you know, it, 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 it really pushes a lot of people out really fast. Last time we talked, it was like a week before the uh, anniversary of, of the of the bombing in, uh, there in West Philadelphia. And uh, and, and the, the city was was offering a, an official apology. Is that right? But there's still a statue of Frank Rizzo in Philadelphia, which is it seems like a totally bizarre contradiction. But I wonder what was that? What was that apology? I think you were you 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 were just about to go receive this apology or be one of the people sort of witnessing this apology. Were you were you there for this apology? Uh, well, it, COVID was in full effect by the time the apology idea came uh, from city council, so there was no opportunity to like receive or reject mm. any kind of apology. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was definitely Frank Rizzo's statue right across the street from the city hall where the apology was supposed to be coming from. Um, I will say that we have had a major victory in the city of Philadelphia because since that um, apology was uh, attempted to be issued um, and since George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and Rashard Brooks and um, some of the other people have been killed by police, the uprisings has forced the city of Philadelphia to remove the Frank Rizzo statue. And that statue has been gone uh, for a couple of weeks now. Okay. Excellent. I'm behind the times. <laughs> Excellent. That one, one statue down. Have there been many other one statues statue, coming uh, down? Many more. Uh, Christopher Columbus's statue on Columbus Boulevard is coming down as well. Um, and the city's called, taking it down. The city's taking it down and we're pushing to take um, we're pushing to have Christopher Columbus Boulevard re, uh, uh, named back to what its original name was, which was Delaware Avenue. Much better. Much better. Mike. We're also, mm -hmm. so speaking of street signs and monuments, we're also pushing to have um, a, a street named after Mumia Abu-Jamal. Oh, yeah. And while, while, while he's still in prison would be quite something to have a street named after him, huh? To have to, to to come home to that would be great. And has uh, you you were also meeting with city officials about the possibility of getting Mumia and other elderly prisoners released, and and uh, that's obviously has not gone anywhere. I, I would have heard if Mumia was out, and he's not, right? Correct, he's not out. No. So that's one of the demands that the Black uh, Radical Philly Collective is working on, trying to get the elders uh, released from prison. These are people that are sixty years old and older, like they. They, they pose no threat to society. There's mm. no there's no risk in releasing these people from prison. There's no harm that they're going to inflict on the community, and the and it doesn't serve the taxpayers uh, at at all to have those people in prison. In fact, it costs taxpayers thirty to sixty thousand dollars a year just in health care for those prisoners. So there's no need to have them in prison. It doesn't serve the community in no way. It actually is a detriment. So. Yeah, we're definitely pushing for the release for the older people and the people that are sick and the people that are affected by um, the container of COVID-19. And then Mumia and so many other people who are in prison are in there for defending uh, their, their other people from violent uh, police in, in the first place. So it, it kind of brings about that whole discussion if I, I mean this this whole discussion around defunding the police and and like um, you, you know it seems like the whole the, the whole question of of uh, black lives mattering has has led to so many different sort of uh, if then statements being made right like if black lives matter then what are we going to do about the mass incarceration right if black lives matter then what are we going to do about these terrible decaying schools full of asbestos you know etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean it just goes on but it seems like these connections are being made so much and and the 13 points in in the black philly collective's uh, list of demands is just uh well really to that uh speaks to that whole question of what do we do uh, for uh, as a society if if black lives do matter right, then it's going to be more than just saying those words right for all these uh people putting the signs up in their nice lawns like all over this city like i i feel like they're putting uh, sometimes i mean i think it's very authentic for a lot of people but for other people they just don't want w their windows getting smashed you know mm -hmm. Like, I don't know yeah. if you remember in 1992, there were all these people putting, you know, all the businesses that were putting up guilty signs, remember? Guilty everywhere? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. 
I hope they mm -hmm. think uh, the cops were guilty, but uh, you know. But um, Mike, the, Mike, when you when you the, one of the best speeches I've probably ever seen on YouTube was uh, of anyone was you speaking a, a few weeks ago um, at a rally in Philadelphia, uh, specifically to a line of riot cops. Oh, and yeah. I wonder if you could just talk about the message that you were communicating to them. I thought it was just, I mean, I, if, I would, I like to think if I were a riot cop, I would have just put my helmet down, and <laughs> quit the police force. And obviously that probably didn't happen, but it's happened at some points in history in other countries in the past. I think, I think, you know, when the people, when, when we say the people, the police, they don't think you're talking about them. And that's the point that I was trying to drive home to the police. Uh, but we're all victims of this of the system. When those when those black cops put those badges down and they take off their gear and they're just at the store with their kids, they're just another black face. And um, and the, and the white ones too. Like they don't they don't get treated the way that they need to be treated with respect and the kind of dignity that, that they that they should get because they're human beings. Um, they get a certain type of protection from the system because they're doing the dirty job that the system wants people to do which is control the people and protect the system uh, but you know when no, when they're of no more value they will be pushed to the pushed to the side just like the vietnam veterans were they'll be pushed to the side just like the people that ha that suffered ptsd after the iraqi war you know after well that's still going on but you know that they that they came back from um these people that 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 are affected by this they're, you know, oftentimes they are cast out as very unimportant, just like, just like the way we're being treated. How many military veterans are on the front line with us who were mm. 30 years ago were on the front line against us? And it's only because of the way that they've been treated. And, you know, it took a lot for them to actually see what we're saying. And they had to get their own examples to, 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 to uh, understand. But they've gotten those examples and it's important for them to hear the words of wisdom and understanding in their heads when they see those examples so that they will be clear on what side they should be on. Because, you know, as I said in my speech, the system is against us all. Mm -hmm. It is against us all. And, um, you know, they may they I can understand them wanting to have camaraderie with their with their police and National Guard brethren. But. When that, is, when that is over and before that began and while it was happening, there's still an issue of systemic racism. There's still an a, a issue of sexism. You know, you know how many millions of people get assaulted in the military by military personnel every single year? Mm -hmm. That how much, of, how much of it is reported is, million, is in the millions every year. How much of it is never reported? It's probably mm. higher, right? So, um, you know, the government the government has issues, and it is not our problem; it's their problem. You know that they that they need to fix, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna make them understand. And if they don't understand, we're gonna force them to understand. Can we um ex can we just explore these? 13 demands. I have them listed here. Um, sure. And um, they are, I mean, it's, it, it, and all the news reports I keep on seeing, it actually, it took a few minutes to actually find the 13 demands, which was kind of interesting because there's all this, it's, you've been getting a lot of news uh, locally around the, the 13 demands and they never list them. Like, you know, of course, it's short, uh, short news stories where they don't have maybe time to list 13 demands, but it's, it's so, uh, it, it's interesting somehow that, that they, and they didn't link to them either on, on uh, the local NPR station, but. But uh, check the box. Hurry up, Tom. I'm listening. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, my no cat, worries. My cat we'll just got out and no, no, no. Hurry up, Tommy. We're, little station break. We're talking with Mike Africa Jr. on discussions with David, which you can hear live at 10 a.m. Pacific, noon Central, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. GMT, Wednesday through Friday every week, along with other broadcasts I host at the same time on Mondays and Tuesdays. All of these broadcasts go out live on the Facebook pages of Popular Resistance, Cable Community Radio, and elsewhere. And they're all archived on my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash on Patreon at patreon.com slash and in podcast form. 
if you look for This Week with David Rovix on any podcasting platform. On on the, the list of uh, 13 demands, Mike, the first one is, is a no to Philadelphia Police Department budget increase, which which uh, is, it sort of gets to the whole thing right right away, and and uh, and it's like such an immediate uh, such an immediate question. If if we're going to be talking about police violence and institutional racism, well, here we go. The police budget that, that's the first the first demand is not increasing the budget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Tom, you got to find them. If we're gonna, if we're gonna deal with this issue of police brutality, police violence, and police terror, the police budget definitely has to be dealt with because, you know, they're being rewarded for their terror. So yeah, police terror, reducing the police budget is saying no to the police budget. That's number one. Number two, immediately cease the criminalization of black resistance. And we're this is we're talking about also including the, the protests that have been going on because people have been getting arrested and charged with felonies and all sorts of stuff in, in the past few for, weeks. Yeah. For 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 throwing a Molotov cocktail in an empty police car, people are facing forty five years to life in prison. Wow. In an empty police car. So yeah, I mean there's definitely like a disparage as it's, it's and they leave the their police cars killed. empty for that purpose, empty, right? It's they leave oh. the. I mean, I've seen that many protests where the police leave their cars empty in the line uh, in in an area where they can be almost certain somebody's going to throw a Molotov at it, and like just be, like they park it, they park their police cars right in the middle of a march and then abandon it. Like I, I don't know if that was good but anyway. We yeah. have evidence that they destroy the cars themselves and blame mm -hmm. on us. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a that's enough. That's that's a big demand. That's a big demand. Immediately and permanently remove all symbols of state violence, and that's um, that, that's a that's a tall and wonderful order. But we're talking about a lot more than just the, the the statues of of people like Frank Rizzo, yeah. Right. So yeah, I mean, we have some demands that are short term and some demands that are much more long term, right? Yeah, I like and the that's mix. Definitely one that is more more long term because, um, you know, to to do that to accomplish that mission. That's a years long process, but it is starting and we have already accomplished um, a couple of steps in that in that goal um, by having the Christopher Columbus statue removed, the Frank Rizzo statue removed and also the St Frank Rizzo mural removed, painted over. Um, so, you know, we're, we're moving on, though. We're, 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 we're encouraged by our success and we're going to keep it going. And protection, number four, protection for Black Philadelphia. And this is something I hadn't heard about that was, that was going on in Philadelphia. I, I mean, it's, it's going on in other cities uh, that I have heard about. But in Philadelphia, which is, a, I mean, it's, it's, it's a Black majority city. Is that right? And, and, and isn't it? Is Philadelphia? It is, it is and, Philadelphia and is 45% Black. And there are, there are far right uh, uh, white people going around with loaded weapons and and terrorizing people in philadelphia i th is that is that that's happening i mean not that just the police but uh, but other private uh, uh private individuals private citizens yeah private citizens are loading up weapons and they're they're not so much anymore a lot when a, when the rioting and looting was happening a lot that's when you mostly saw them and when they were talking about removing the Christopher Columbus statue, that, that was happening a lot, too. They were standing in front of it with long, with uh, armed. Uh, yeah, for sure. And the police uh, would would be protecting them uh, generally, right? Yeah, so the police would stand in front of them and protect them from us. And, you know, if anything went down, we were the ones that would be targeted by the police for any type of disturbance or... Um, violating their rights to carry a weapon. And has ha, have they been using uh, cars as weapons as well, like has happened in many other cities? Cars, Running into uh, crowds? Yeah, oh yeah, that's that's been happening. Um, uh, cars, a truck drove through. Um, the police, mm. obviously, you know, the tear gas. And, you know, pe the police were actually, like, walking up to people that were just protesting, and they were just, like, 
literally spraying people right in their faces, women, you know, just spraying them right in their faces. You know, just for standing in the street. And spraying them. Yeah, wow. just for standing in the street. Has the uh, city council been reacting against uh, the police uh, violence at all or just being supportive of them? Um, so city council is made up of, I believe, 17 different members. And you have some members that are, you see him, Tommy? You have 17 members that are diverse, right? So like some members are the ones that pushed for the apology for move. And then you have some members that were pushing to raise the police budget. So, um, you know, at any given time, the city council could be split. And um, the uh, end all carceral, carceral systems. This is a country, of course, that uh, as I hope uh, everybody know, out there knows, uh, we have 4% uh, of the world's population and 25% of the world's incarcerated population. Uh, but um, th this is, uh, we got a cat, a missing cat over there. Is that? Yeah, yeah. Uh-oh. I don't know if you found him or not. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No worries. Uh, so is, is, it, is it an indoor cat or, or does the cat roam it's, around outdoors? So it's an indoor cat, but he wants to be an outdoor cat. But he uh -huh. doesn't recognize the dangers of the outdoors yet. Like cars. Yeah. Like cars. Mm -hmm. So we just we just have to be mindful of him. And he's my daughter's cat and she's not here. Oh, that could be dangerous. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so, so my neighbor is telling them about it. Yeah, okay. Mm. Yeah, neighbor's looking out for the cat too. Yeah. Good. And um, it's, it's a, the question of, it, I mean, the, you know, some cities have actually been you know, talking about defunding the police, which I think is is making uh, the 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 powers that be um, uh, really scared to hear them even talking about it. And I, I mean, I don't know to what extent this idea might get implemented, but it's um it's uh, if without the police, their whole their whole power structure falls apart, doesn't it? Uh, I mean, the, the police are definitely there to keep their power structure intact. They're not there to serve and protect the people. They're the police exists to make sure that the people are protected, to make sure that industry is protected from the people. Um, you know, <laughs> the problem with this is that the police, the, the, the industry, the system is so diabolical and they are so dirty that they don't even consider that if they just didn't, you know, how, how do you say, you catch more bur uh, bees with honey, mm. you catch more flies with honey. Like, if the police were actually the Barney Fife type police officers that, you know, helped you get your cat when you, lo when you lose your cat. Yeah, where is the cop helping you to find your cat there? Huh? There's no police in sight looking for that cat, huh? I no. seriously doubt that anyone will be calling for the disbanding of the police. <laughs> People aren't calling for the, you know, so that's the issue. It's like, if you disband, if you dis, if you dis, dis, um, if you defund the police and the police don't have as much money, that would be an improvement. See, um, the problem with them having such an abundance of funds is that you also have this company called the um, Smith and Wesson and Taurus and, and Ruger and all these companies that want to sell guns and they don't care about who gets killed from them. Right. They hope people get killed from guns so that the gun sales can go up and the police are switching out their guns yearly, buying more toys that they can use to, to destroy people. And that's the real issue. It, you know, <clears throat> If the, if the playing field was more even and the police didn't have guns 
or even if they did, even if they, I mean, look, 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 they're carrying guns, tasers. You got him, Tom? Tom, you got him? He found him. They're I carrying guns, tasers, handcuffs, zip ties, flashlights that they beat people with. They're carrying so much weaponry. And the average person has nothing. You know, I mean, even the people that do own guns, they don't, they don't just carry them walking down the street. It's the imbalance. If we had, uh, if George, if the cops that killed George Floyd were unarmed, he George Floyd probably would not be dead. The reason people don't defend to each other and they just hold the camera yeah. is because they know that if they next, try they'll to, be shot. they'll be shot. So, and then, oh, of course, me, you the, may have the, the a gun, but. The, you're going to oh, go yeah. to and prison then, for 40 years if you use it. And if you're a cop, then you're just going to, you'll get re you get escape. a reward. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the defunding of the police is not necessarily, not necessarily calling for the disbanding of police, but it's definitely calling for um, uh, reducing their budgets so that they're not so heavily armed. They're militarized now. And, and that's, that's, that's not what the police department says that their job is. Their job is to serve and protect the people. It's certainly what people are they talking about? And the more and money they, they get, the more money the police get, the less uh, it, it seems always that uh, the social services are being cut. Everything else in the budget is getting cut in order to fund the police. And I, I didn't actually even, and I mean, I, I, pay, I think I pay attention to this stuff, but I did not even realize that most cities are spending almost half of their budgets on the police. Well, see that, and that brings us to one of our demands, right? Schools. So, if you look at the amount of budget cuts that are made when it comes to education, the things that we went when we were in school, we could have come. By the time we were finished, we were able to get a job and maybe start our own businesses. And we had metal shop and wood shop, and we had uh, home economics. And we had all these different trades and you could learn how to drive by the time you got out of school. And there was so many opportunities for people to, to have because the education was there. When I was in school, we had a nurse full time and the nurse got there before you got there. And the nurse left when you uh, after you left, you know, she, her car was the last car in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. Now, in some of the schools, you know, um, Saudi, um, um, What's her last name? Saudia. She runs this Philadelphia Student Union here in the city. And, or no, she doesn't run it, but she's a member of it. And she was reading a statement about how there was a, um, I think, an eighth grade girl who um, had an asthma attack. And she, she died at the school. Mm -hmm. And she died because there was no nurse there that could help mm -hmm. figure out what was going on or help her. And... And that's because the nurse is only there two days a week because they, if the school budget don't allow for the, the nurse to be there full time. But you have multiple police officers that are stationed there every day, all day, and for the entire length of the year. So that's a problem. When people are being afraid to be uh, afraid to even go to school because there's police officer there, it doesn't make the people in the black community feel safe at all. Mm -mm. And, uh, Number 12, it's disband all private police departments. Can you talk about that? Right. What what private police departments we're talking about, like uh, security, like G4S and these security companies? So in the city of Philadelphia, there is the Philadelphia police. There are the University City District Police. There's the Penn, Penn, Penn Cops. University of Pennsylvania Police Force. There's the Drexel Police Force. There's the Temple Police Force. There are um, so many different private police companies in the city of Philadelphia. And they're not necessary. When something happens, because some of these colleges border other college er uh, areas, 
you got three different police departments showing up for one simple incident. And because there's so much police, there's um, much less arrests to be made. But their, but their quotas need to be met. So now they're forcing their police to arrest people. Otherwise, mm. they're seen as obsolete and, and, and unneeded. So they're, they, they're trying to fill their quotas. And who are they targeting? They're targeting people that can't afford legal, legal counsel. They're targeting people who don't even have the wherewithal to even know what a legal counselor is. They're targeting poor people. They're targeting black people, you know. So, yeah, that's that's a that's a call. We we want we want to disband those police departments, and um, let people know in the process what that is. The communities can police themselves before the before the before the government um, brought crack into our areas in the '80s. We didn't have these problems in our communities. We had fights just like anybody anywhere would have fights. The police departments have fights within themselves. Mm. You know, where humans exist, there's going to be disagreements. That's just natural. But um, for them to come into our neighborhoods and just absorb our resources and then patrol us and control us, no, we ain't having that. And when they get awarded for arrests like that, it's so it's so reminiscent of soldiers being award being sort of awarded for body count, like that was yeah. A, you know yeah, it's su such a military orientation to to. Uh, uh, and then the uh, the question of of reparative, reparative economic justice for the aforementioned harms to the black communities in in number thirteen. I wonder just. Uh, that's that's such a huge question i know but i what what would that begin to look like in in your view right so so you know restorative justice right uh reparations and restorative justice is, sim is similar but it's a little bit different as explained by the elders restorative justice is basically doing a, whatever is necessary to make the community whole again you know, like like in a case of move in 1985, they can't give us back our family. But there's a lot of things that that would be helpful toward um, making us whole, as whole as we can be. Um, like the release of our prisoners, the demand for that um, was one thing. Um, compensation for the people that don't have the ability to get a job don't have the ability to have a home to live in. They've been in prison 40 years. They came home in their 60s and they got cancer. There's no way that they can work a job. Um, but as the city of Philadelphia apologizes for giving them people too much time, the governor, uh, the, uh, the district attorney, Ed Rendell, who, who was part of the prosecuting team, um, admitted that he wished that he did not give them as much time. And if he could do it over again, he would he would do it differently. Bit late. So why is that? Why is that being um, said now? But the people that are feeling the effects of that injustice still don't have a home, a proper home to live in, or um, the proper type of funding that they need, or the health care that they need. You know, um, all of those things need to be taken into consideration. And then also, there's the issue of the community itself. There are so many people that are affected by what happened to move on May 13th, 1985, not just move. Um, and so, you know, there's a need for collective care. There's a need for collective organization. There's a need for restorative justice. Hell yeah. And when your parents were released from prison, if they didn't have you to, to, to help out or uh, you know, other people, I mean, they, they, they would have been just... I mean, they were basically they're in their 60s and they're just being released after 40 years in prison. And they would have just been basically thrown out onto the streets if it were up to the to the to the government. Right. I mean, it was it was. Well, you can't even be paroled unless you have a home plan. There are certain people that may parole. They meet all the criteria, but they don't have any family. So they stay in prison because they've been in prison for decades and their family just is not around anymore, basically. And they've lost touch. And then they just keep them in there. So. When it comes to, so there's the difference between being paroled and maxing out. If you max out, you your sentence is over. You did your 10 to 20 and the 20 is over. 
so they let you out. They basically give you a bus ticket, send you on your way, and with a with a box that you came to prison with, whatever you have, that's it. And Whether you have family or not, away. right? Whether you have family or not, so a lot of them end up on park benches. Um, but if you have family, if you on to get onto parole, you have to have a family. You have to have a home plan. You have to have job in place. You have to have you have to meet certain criteria. A lot of people don't have family. Their mothers and parents, their parents are gone. They've been in prison so long. Their fathers and mothers are dead. They're they're they don't have any brothers and sisters. They don't have any nieces and nephews or grandchildren. They went in when they were juveniles. They didn't have any kids, so they don't have anyone. So, I know people that have been in prison and was granted parole but they have been in a holding pattern in the jail because they can't find someone that will accept them to come home to. So it's a, it's a huge issue. And it's a much bigger issue. It seems than than like uh, private organizations like the Mira Paul fund or whatever is, is in any situation to be able to deal with. I mean, obviously th th there needs to be real, government funding to, to 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 change the situation in so many ways but but the people that that who are actually in prison and and uh i mean i wonder do you have any idea how many people we're talking about or if are, are there organ does the mirapal fund or any other groups like that try to help uh house people so that they can get out of prison when they're in that kind of situation is is there or is it just completely broken structures well it's it's mostly broken structures i mean you know, rent in the city of Philadelphia for a small room is up. You could be paying 200 bucks a week. Wow. So um, it's not easy to just fund someone. No. Especially someone that doesn't have the ability to get a job. Um, the Maripool Foundation, they, they are really, really good about supporting um, ap activist people. And um, they've been very instrumental in helping to support my family and myself and making sure that I got to visit my parents when I was a kid. They paid for a lot of that stuff to happen. Um, but housing is a different beast. Yeah. You know, trying to make sure that someone has a place to live and paying that bill. A lot of homeowners or renters won't even, a lot of landlords won't even accept that type of pay. Um, so it's a it's a it's a problem here that definitely need to be explored and um, and reconstructed. And you've been. Can you talk about the group that you're, you're see, seeds of wisdom? Oh, the cat's escaped again. <laughs> Hello, cat. So we can we can yeah. interview the cat, although the cat might not be too responsive. But. This connection is getting worse, I think. Yeah, it's getting worse. I don't know, but it, <laughs> and it, it sounds like there's a third person in the. You know, maybe it's the NSA. It could be. You find With you. With you now. He's under the trampoline. I just saw him under the trampoline. Okay. So, what, what was the question you asked me? Can you talk about the seeds, seeds of wisdom, the group that you're you, you've been doing, organizing around this group, and and I saw something about appealing for funds on Instagram. Right. So the seed of wisdom is um, the sister chapter of the Move organization, and um, our mission is to encourage people to protect life, and um. And when we say life, we're talking about our people, animals, and the environment. And uh, what we really do is we encourage people to be healthy. We encourage children to be active, and we find we try to find um, healthy and we try to find playful, fun ways for them to do that. Uh, one of the things that we do is we give away bikes to kids that can't afford to buy them themselves, um, and we get. Mike, um, you're breaking up. Can you can you go back outside? <laughs> <laughs> You're breaking up. Oh. We lost him. I think uh, hopefully we get him back in a minute. He can click that link. But you are, um, 
We're talking with Mike Africa Jr. on Discussions with David, which you can hear live at 10 a.m. Pacific, noon Central, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. GMT, Wednesday through Friday every week, along with other broadcasts I hope uh, host at the same time on Mondays and Tuesdays. All of these broadcasts go out live on the Facebook pages of Popular Resistance, KBU Community Radio, and elsewhere. And they're all archived on my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash drovix, on Patreon at patreon.com slash davidrovix, and in podcast form if you look for This Week with David Rovix on any podcasting platform. And we were just talking with Mike about the Seeds of Wisdom uh, organization, which he has been involved with founding and running, which does a lot of work in the community there in West Philadelphia with kids. And you can look them up. Uh, if you look for Mike Africa Jr. and Seeds of Wisdom, it'll come right up on various uh, places. Hoping he might be uh, clicking on that link, but we might have we might have lost him for some other reason other than the line uh, getting bad in there. It could have also been a battery or who knows what, but, um, but it was getting near the end of the show anyway. So that might have been the entirety of my discussion with Mike Africa Jr. This time we'll get him back, perhaps with a better connection sometime. Um, but um, yeah, it's uh, thanks for tuning in to this conversation with Mike Africa Jr. You can find this and other discussions with David in archived form in various locations, such as the discussions with David playlist on youtube.com slash drovix at patreon.com slash David Rovix at soundcloud.com slash David Rovix and on any podcasting platform. If you search for the podcast this week with David Rovix, my latest album notes from a failed state is now up on Spotify and all the other usual music streaming platforms. The music, the live stream broadcasts and the podcasts are all free. But if you want to support my journalistic and musical efforts, plus have access to some exclusive offerings just for patrons, please join my Community Supported Art Program, or CSA, at davidrovix.com slash subscribe or patreon.com slash davidrovix. Artists for Rent Control is now set up to start organizing an emergency eviction response team. Please go to artistsforrentcontrol.org and sign up. Hope to see you again soon here in the Matrix and out on the streets. Don't pay the rent and don't be afraid of your neighbors. Mutual aid will get us through. Bye for now.